Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We're going to start today with Anna Edgerton of Bloomberg News. She's down in Washington. We've got a lot to talk about with trade and impeachment. Let's start with trade. We had the president tweeting out this morning that we're very, very close to a really big deal both sides wanted. What do we make of that, Anna? Well, we're, of course, looking forward to that December 15th deadline when tariffs are supposed to go up on products from China. So the question is whether or not the United States is going to decide to you know, put off or even reduce those tariffs. And that would be a signal that we'll look at going forward to the final stage of the negotiations for the phase one trade deal. If those tariffs are not put in place on December 15th, that's a good sign for these negotiations going forward. OK, what about a good sign for USMCA? Where does that stand now? The Democrats say they have an agreement. Why aren't we getting it turned into a legislation? So it does take a little bit of time to write the implementing bill. And Nancy Pelosi warned us previously about this, saying that, you know, it will take a little bit of time to actually write the bill that Congress needs to pass. The good news is that everyone appears to have signed on to the principles of the changes that were made at the insistence of Democrats. We still do expect that vote next week in the House of Representatives, although Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell over in the Senate said they're not going to take it up until next year. And in the meantime, there's this thing called impeachment going on. They're having hearings. Normally, you think that would be historic. Everything would grind to halt. But it seems like Congress is just going on about its business. Is that what's happening? Well, that is a really important point for Nancy Pelosi to say that they're not just investigating the president, that they're not as impeachment obsessed as Republicans have accused them of being, that they are still legislating and trying to accomplish big things like passing this USMCA. There has been pushback from some progressive Democrats that Nancy Pelosi is working with President Trump to pass this trade deal and give him a political win before the election next year. But it's really important for her to give her moderate members who are going to be campaigning next year as well in swing districts to be able to say, look at what I accomplished. I don't care. You know, if the president is a Republican. I'm going to do important things for the American people. Okay, Anna, thank you so much for your reporting from Washington. That's Anna Edgerton, our very own. And now we want to turn back to the USMCA. That's the successor agreement to NAFTA. Welcome now one of the House members who will be voting on it soon, we believe. He's Congressman Michael McCall of Texas. He's a Republican ranking member on the Foreign Affairs Committee. He comes to us from Capitol Hill. So, Mr. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. Let's start Thanks, with the David. fact that there were some changes made made in the USMCA as negotiated by Ambassador Lighthizer. How do you stand with those changes? Some Republicans seem to be not very comfortable. Are you comfortable with what was done? You know, yes, I am. I, I think uh, the, the two sticking points was labor issues in Mexico and also the, uh, the patents on uh, pharmaceuticals um, uh, going from uh, uh, 10 years to where they are today. Uh, look, this is an important piece of legislation, a treaty that we need to um, uh, put through the Congress. So we're talking about, you know, basically, we're talking about 12 million American jobs, about $1.2 trillion for the American people. My home state of Texas, Mexico is the largest trading partner, and it's about a million jobs for uh, Texas and about $137 billion. So this is, you know, lots been made about giving the president a political win. I would argue this is not, a, a, should be uh, held hostage by politics. This is a win for the American worker, first and foremost, and it's not a win for either political party, but rather for the American worker. And it's, imper you know, it's very uh, imperative that we pass this as soon as possible. Well, as soon as possible, exactly, Congressman. We hear what you say from both sides of the aisle right now. This is a win for Americans, the American worker, no question about it. You talk about holding a political hostage. Then why does uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, majority leader, say we're not going to even get to it until after an impeachment trial? Why don't we just get it voted through on the House and the Senate and get that benefit for the Americans? Well, you know, we, uh, we're extending our... Uh, our time up here to next week. Uh, you know, we do have this thing called impeachment going on. Uh, we do have to fund the government uh, uh, next week. So there's a lot on the plate. I do think you're going to see this thing pass the House next week, and then it will be taken up by the Senate. By all accounts, from what I'm hearing, the impeachment process in the Senate uh, will go rather quickly. Uh, McConnell's indicated with no witnesses it's going to go fast. And I do think U USMCA will be on the fast track in the Senate. We also have news today uh, out of the White House and elsewhere about U.S.-China negotiations that maybe we're getting very, very close, according to the president, to what he calls a big deal. Maybe we'll be rolling back some of the tariffs. What, how do you react to that? Uh, I think very positive. Uh, I, I think it, it, you have to look at it in two phases. Uh, the first phase is really the, the, you know, the uh, really trade imbalance of hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, that is the first phase I think is the most likely uh, to get an agreement on. 
And what uh, your prior uh, guest talked about was this deadline in December that I think the, the president will defer and not impose additional tariffs, uh, may actually relax those tariffs in exchange for China agreeing to import more of our ag commodities. Uh, this would be a huge, significant step forward. The second step deals more with the intellectual property theft, the espionage piece that I think is going to take a, a longer time to negotiate. But if we can get this first phase done and we can pass the USMCA, the, the impact on the American economy and the stock market uh, will be really overwhelming. And I think it's going to put every American's pension, everyone's 401k in a very strong position uh, going into next year. We're talking with Representative Michael McCall of Texas. Uh, Representative, you've been quite outspoken on the Hong Kong situation. I wonder whether you think it's fine to go ahead with a deal that, as you suggest, might actually roll back some of the tariffs. There was reporting from Bloomberg earlier today to that effect. Do that at the same time we haven't got the Hong Kong situation resolved. We're very clear on our position with Hong Kong. We stand with freedom and democracy over dictatorship and tyranny. Uh, President Xi, I think, is misbehaving in the region. Uh, we stand with the people of Hong Kong on this one. Uh, but we also want to trade deal with President Xi, and that's the balance that the president's trying to uh, coordinate right now. But he also uh, he did sign uh, our bill that we passed out of my committee on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And we're always going to stand with human rights and, and freedom-loving people over tyranny and dictatorship uh, any day of the week. Uh, I don't think that's going to impact should hopefully won't impact this trade agreement with uh, China, certainly the first phase. And finally, Congressman, you mentioned the funding of the government that needs to get done next week if we're not going to uh, actually have the government shut down. There was talk there would just be a continual resolution to sort of kick the can down the road, as they say, into the new year. Do you believe at this point there can be an omnibus solution here that will really get the appropriations done before the end of next week? Yeah, I'm hearing uh, from the appropriators we'll probably have several uh, spending uh, bills on the floor to keep the government open. A CR, I hope, uh, is not going to be the likely situation. CRs are uh, the biggest reason I oppose CRs. Uh, while I don't agree with shutting down the government, CRs greatly impact our military. They hurt our readiness. And uh, we need to keep our military strong in what is a very dangerous world right now. Okay, Congressman, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. That's Congressman Michael McCall, Republican you, of Texas. And he is, of course, the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Now it's time to get a check on the markets and how they are reacting to today's top stories. Joining us is Abigail Doolittle. Now, Abigail, you promised me we would not talk about trade today. I think you're going to break your promise. I think I have to break that <laughs> promise. It's amazing what one tweet can do. Of course, yeah. President Trump earlier tweeting that the U.S. and China are close to a deal. And we just saw stocks take off at the highs up more than 1%, the best day in more than a month. It's interesting, though, David, not as high now. In fact, well off of those highs. A big piece of that is Apple. Take a look at those shares of Apple down 1%. Now, on Monday, there was a cautious commentary from Daniel Ives uh, at Needham on Apple around trade. Today, Credit Suisse is out saying uh, that the iPhone sales are slowing in China. Yesterday, here on Bloomberg TV, we had one of the uh, street's top technicians, David Keller, saying that it looks like these shares are ready to pull back uh, on technical reasons. Basically, there are higher highs, which tells you uh, some folks are really liking the stock, but the momentum is falling. Right now, it is falling. So technical may be the answer to my question, because mm -hmm. I would have thought Apple would particularly benefit, because there was concerned with the new tariffs to go into effect on the 15th, that they would hit Apple particularly. And if there's easy attention, they'd benefit maybe more than others. But maybe there are technical aspects that you always understand so well. Well, it probably is quite a bit of technical selling, both for the major averages and for Apple, because you're right. If those tariffs didn't go into place, that would really benefit Apple, because they were set to perhaps take a $150 tariff hit per iPhone. There was some talk that there could be some sort of an exemption there, because President Trump and CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, had met. Um, but that could have been a, a benefit. It. But this stock, David, take a look at this, up 70% yeah. on the year, the best year since 2009. Again, that bargain basement buying right. traders just going in yeah. there and scooping this thing up with both arms. Now they're taking some chips off the table, especially on some of these technical signals. Well, and it's hard not to cash in some of those chips when you're up 70%. I mean, yes, that's, that's pretty absolutely. Tempting. Okay, many thanks to Abigail Doolittle for that check on the markets. Coming up here, impossible. That's the view Senate Majority Leader McConnell has on the Senate taking up the USMCA anytime soon. We talk with his colleague, Senator Kevin Kramer of North Dakota. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
there's a lot of changes made by the Democrats that uh, Republicans wish had not been made, but in order to get this otherwise very good agreement through the House of Representatives, they probably had to be negotiated. So it was compromised in a way that I feel that uh, the overall uh, thing is very, very good, and we may lose some Republicans because of it, but it's going to get through the United States Senate uh, probably easier than it gets through the House of Representatives. That was Senator Chuck Grassley speaking yesterday about the fate of USMCA in Congress. For more on the renegotiated trade deal, we welcome now one of his colleagues in the Senate, the Republican Caucus. He is Senator Kevin Kramer of North Dakota, coming to us for Capitol Hill. So, Senator, welcome. Are you going to be one of those Republicans he may lose? Oh, no. No, certainly not. Uh, USMCA is so important uh, to North Dakota. You know, North Dakota is a lot like Iowa, except we actually border our northern neighbor, Canada. And we do about $6 billion of exports a year, 88% of which are be with Canada and Mexico. So that's, you know, Me Mexico, Canada are very, very important to North Dakota. And, you know, if perfection is the enemy of, of better, uh, th then we don't get very good deals. So, uh, you know, nobody's king and 535 people can't negotiate a perfect deal. So if this is something that's good, if not perfect, good for Americans. We hear that from both Republicans and Democrats. Why not get it into effect right away? I mean, time's a waste in here. You get more benefits. And as you know, we have the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, saying, you know, we can't take it up until after we're done with a trial and impeachment. We're well into the new year, aren't we? Well, that's right, but we do have this thing called the law that we have to deal with, and, and the calendar automatically kicks into impeachment once we receive the articles of impeachment. We might be able to take Christmas off, so that's that's a complicating factor. However, I mean, only speaking for me now, I would stay through this weekend, next week, next weekend, uh, up to Christmas, if, if that's what it took to get USMCA done. It's that important, in my view, to get that done because it's, it's got more value than even just the you know the, the six billion dollars from North Dakota, it's, it's uh, obviously important to American jobs, it's important to America's economy, but it's also added leverage in the other trade deals. This is, the, you know, trade deals have an, an escalating impact, a cascading value, if you will, as we're dealing around the world. I think it really strengthens the president's hand with China, as an example. We're talking with Senator Kevin Kramer of North Dakota. Uh, so if this, this, this bill is that successful, that good, how fast can you get the impeachment trial done? And there's been talk about whether there'll be any witnesses yeah. Is called or not. What's your sense of that as one of the jurors, as it were, in that trial? Yeah, so my sense of it is, and in my opinion, maybe more importantly, is that I don't think we ought to aim for a big, long trial. As much as as much fun as it might be to call witnesses that, that provide exculpatory uh, evidence and testimony for our president, I think the, the weakness of the Democrats' hand and the House, uh, you know, evidence coming over, we could we could hear their evidence and we could hear the uh, the uh, rebuttal by the president's lawyers. I think and go right to a vote on on both articles. I mean, the one is completely contrived and and I think that that getting on with it getting America on, on to, toward the election you know that's only going to be 10 months later I think that has more value frankly than exonerating the president and I also believe that politically speaking that the president's coming out ahead on this whole process as, as I thought it would in the first place so you know, I, I don't feel the need for a long, a long trial. And I think there's a growing sentiment for that, actually. Senator Kramer, let's turn to a somewhat different subject that sometimes can divide the White House from including Republicans up on the Hill, and that is possible sanctions against Turkey and Russia. Where do you stand on that? So I tend to support sanctions on Turkey and Russia. I, I will never forget that when we first got... Uh, here, I was still in the House at the time. The president, of course, uh, was elected and sworn in, and we did the, those sanctions on Russia, and I immediately ended up on a trip to um, Kazakhstan to explain uh, that we, we, it's not aimed at our allies in the region. I know that these things get complicated, but I think that uh, it, with certain actors in cer certain circumstances, uh, it's best to look out for America's national defense, and I think that sanctions are appropriate. But I also understand that... Uh, you know, diplomacy is complicated, but I think I think we need to do something. Yeah, you put it so well, Senator. Diplomacy is sometimes com complicated. Are you concerned that, ironically, sanctions on Turkey may drive t Turkey, an ally, more into the arms of the other possible uh, subject of sanctions, that is Russia? Because certainly President Putin is courting President Erdogan. There's no question about that, but, you know, and, and, and Turkey's obviously an important NATO ally. They're the second largest army in NATO. But we can't, we also can't just look the other way when they, when they commit egregious acts. And, uh, and frankly, in terms of 
you know, driving him into the arms of Vladimir Putin, as, as some people put it, uh, to some degree that's, uh, that ship's sort of sailed. And I think unless we add some strength to, uh, to our relationship with Turkey, we're just, we're just letting them, we're facilitating uh, that courtship rather than, than fighting back a little bit. Senator Kramer, you're on the Armed Services Committee, I believe. Give us an uh, assessment of the extent of the risk to U.S. national security of those S-400 Russian missiles being put into Turkey. We have heard that perhaps that yeah. really curtails, for example, our use of F-35s in the area. Well, that, that's exactly right. So the, so the S-400, of course, is the Russian uh, anti-air uh, defense system, and it could be used against our F-35s, and it's why we stopped the sale of F-35s to Turkey itself, because we don't need our aircraft being tested against, or, 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 their, or their defense system, the Russian defense system, tested against our top uh, you know, fighter jet. So um, that's part of that complicated relationship that we have with President Erdogan and, and, uh, and Turkey. So um, yeah, the result, of course, is that a bunch of F-35s that were going to be sold to Turkey aren't being sold to Turkey. We hope now through the National Defense Authorization Act um, that we're able to utilize those uh, those jets in other places, including probably in our own Air Force. And Senator, finally, if all that weren't complicated enough, the complications with Turkey go well back in the beginning of the 20th century with Armenians who were killed. And the question of whether it was genocide, there has been repeated attempts to declare it genocide. That evidently has been stopped in part to make sure we don't drive Turkey away. Where are you on that issue? Yeah, so last week I actually uh, blocked the unanimous consent uh, uh, to that resolution on the floor. And the reason I did it was it was literally the day after President Trump got home from, from the NATO trip where he visited with uh, President Erdogan specifically about genocide, specifically about the S-400. I support the, the resolution. I will vote for the resolution the next time it comes up. Uh, but I just felt like we need to get a full reading from the president's uh, negotiations with President Erdogan before we, you know, the, the, the engines of Air Force One were barely cooled down when when the resolution was brought to the floor for unanimous consent. I, I think that uh, it's a resolution that needs to pass. I think it will soon, and, and it certainly will with my support. That's very helpful. Thank you, sir. That's Senator Kevin Kramer, Republican of North Dakota, coming to us from Capitol Hill. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, the House Judiciary Committee has rejected Republican Jim Jordan's amendment that would have eliminated the first article of impeachment against President Trump, which accuses him of abuse of power. The vote was 17 to 23 along party lines. It was the first vote on an amendment after about three hours of debate. At the end of the day, lawmakers will be asked to decide whether to send two articles of impeachment to the House floor for debate and vote. The president says the United States and China are very close to signing a big trade deal. He tweeted today, quote, they want it and so do we. That contrasted with remarks he made last week that he liked the idea of waiting until after the 2020 elections here in the U.S. to sign a deal. There are expectations that a tariff increase planned for Sunday will be called off while those talks progress. Greenpeace activists scaled the European Union's new headquarters in Brussels today, unfurling a huge banner warning of a climate emergency. The demonstration came as the bloc's leaders gathered for the start of a two-day summit focused on plans to combat global warming. The EU leaders are set to debate ways for the 28-nation bloc to become carbon neutral by 2050. Ten former National Football League players have been charged with defrauding a health care program run by the league. They include five former players on the Washington Redskins, including Clinton Portis and Carlos Rogers. The Justice Department says the players submitted nearly $4 million in false claims to the health care plan and received more than $3.4 million in payouts. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Mark. Still ahead, there's gambling going on in Macau, at least for a win, with our stock of the hour up on good news about trade and about Macau. Uh, that's next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for the stock of the hour. Wynn Resorts is the best performer in the S&P 500 today, rising about 6% and reaching its highest level since July. And that's on optimism over trade and Macau. 
Kaylee Lines is here with more. Kaylee. Well, we know that Macau was very important to win in wow, the third that's quarter. Sure. It made up about 65 <laughs> percent of their total revenue share. So all of the ebbs and flows in Macau are very vital to win. And we know that it hasn't been a great story for pretty much the duration of this year. Actually, gambling revenues uh, in Macau are set to fall 3 percent, and that would be the first yearly decline we've seen since 2016. So that's not a great story. A lot of that has been because of geopolitical uncertainty ranging from trade, which is a narrative that maybe looks a bit better as of five minutes ago when I last checked, <laughs> right. uh, and in relation to Hong Kong, disruptions in travel because of the ongoing protests. But today it looks like Hong Kong may actually prove to be a bit of a boon to Macau. Reuters reporting that China President Xi Jinping are looking to really build out Macau as a financial hub to create a stock exchange, do more to diversify the economy of that region away from just gambling. And of course, that could bring more people in the door and could get people to gamble. And President Xi's attitude toward Macau is so critical. As right. early as you remember, he sort of cut back on some of the high spending for some of the, the leaders in the country, and it really hurt Macau badly. So if he's saying, let's go with Macau, that's big news for Macau as well as win. Yeah, not only gets people to the enclave, but you're exactly right. VIP gambling has been yeah. such a big weakness point, not only for win, but consumers you know, operators in the region more broadly. So that may be a narrative that she uh, is changing, and that could be a, a big boon to some of these companies. So there's a headline. President Xi likes gambling in Macau. <laughs> so we go with that? Okay. Oh, Maybe, sort of. Okay, many thanks to Kaylee Lines. Up next, central banks in the United States and Europe are getting ready for the new year with their decisions this week. We talk with Simona Makuda. She is State Street Global Advisors Senior Economist. This is Balance of Power. We are on Bloomberg Television and on radio. ahead. We will be monitoring the effects of our recent policy actions along with other information bearing on the outlook as we assess the appropriate path of the target range for the federal funds rate. Of course, if developments emerge that cause a material reassessment of our outlook, we would respond accordingly. Policy is not on a preset course. That was Fed Chair Jay Powell at his news conference yesterday saying they'll keep a careful eye on the economy as we head into the new year, but so far, so good. Welcome now, Simona Makuda. She is State Street Global Senior Economist. Welcome, Simona. Good to have you with us. Nice to be here. So what, did, what was your overall takeaway? Because what my impression was, he was saying, you know, we're doing pretty well. We don't need to do much on the upside or the downside as we go really much through 2020 at this point. I conclude the same thing. I think the Fed does feel quite comfortable where they are, feeling they've done, you know, a decent amount of stimulus over the course of 2019. So now let's watch and see how this plays out through the economy and also let's see how the risk to the outlook play out. So I think uh, we are looking for a prolonged pause. That was the message I got from yesterday. And one of the risks that we were talking about, the Fed was talking about, was trade. Does it feel that that's a bit diminished now? Now, we don't know what's going to happen this weekend yet, but the president's saying we're pretty close. Um, do we want to take that chance and <laughs> conclude that the, now is uh, the winning time? We hope so. I mean, we really do tend to try to drown out the noise a little bit and focus on the incentives that we believe both sides have to de-escalate at this stage. So we are definitely assuming in our baseline for 2020 that we do have a phase one deal and that we do have some tariff relief. Uh, the timing is hard to tell. At the same time, if you go along the top line numbers, as an investor looking into 2020, there are some divergences. It's not all headed in the same direction. Some things are going up, some things are going down. For example, services versus manufacturing. So what are you advising investors, basically, as they position themselves in 2020? The theme of divergence has been core to our house view for many months. We've been talking not about just a one divergence between manufacturing and services, but really also between business investment and consumer spending. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing, this is not just a U.S. theme, but we see this around the globe. The way we look at it is to say that there is actually resilience in this divergence, right? We are not firing on all cylinders, but the cylinders that matter most for the economy, namely consumer spending and services, those are firing. So we look at all of this and conclude that we see the glass half full. And so another divergence has been U the U.S., particularly in equities versus Europe in particular. Do you see that continuing into the new year? So I think you have to differentiate between the very recent past, where actually European equities have caught up a little mm -hmm. bit. There is a long way to go. But in our 
broad view that the U.S. slows slightly in 2020, the rest of the world does a little bit better, you are looking at a bit of a closing of that performance gap. And in fact, we do believe that if you do get trade de-escalation, that could uh, benefit Europe more than the U.S. because Europe is more exposed to the global economic cycle, external demand, etc. So you could potentially actually see more of an upside in Europe. Which takes us to Frankfurt and Madame Lagarde's premier, the president of the ECB. What did you take away from what she said, what the ECB said today? I think my point, um, the core conclusion for me is that there is no urgency for immediate action. Again, let's watch and see how the economic data unfolds. There is obviously still early but broadening signs of a bottoming out in the global manufacturing cycle. That speaks to the German situation very, very directly. If that really materializes, strengthens over the course of the next few months, I think it should allow the ECB to, you know, just assess. I think there are not in a rush to reverse course and normalize, but um, at some point they will want to normalize. Well, and, and, and they're assessing the ECB, but also Madame Lagarde, I thought was pretty explicit in saying, we need a little help here. We need some fiscal help. And by the way, can't the, the European Union figure out what it means to be investing in green? I thought she was pretty direct in saying, you need to get moving, guys. Uh, they've been saying, not just the ECB, but many central banks around the world have been sort of desperately calling for additional levers of policy, right? This is a problem because we've been very one-handed in terms of the policy response, and we do need to do something more. When she first came in as the head of the ECB, our initial response was that perhaps she might uh, have more impact, not just on monetary policy, but on fiscal policy. Mm. But it's a lot of hurdles to be crossed. I think, however, being more vocal, more direct, more specific about what the ECB would like to see, it helps. It helps the cause and sort of build that case. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to have been a senior French politician either. I mean, exactly. she sort of knows her way around exactly. over there, which is exactly. encouraging. Okay, many thanks to Simona Makuda. She's from State Street Global Advisors. And now for Bloomberg First Word News, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, as we've been reporting, the House Judiciary Committee argued through a marathon session today ahead of voting to send impeachment charges against President Trump to the full House. Speaker Nancy Pelosi sounded confident Democrats will have the votes to impeach the president next week, but she said it's up to individual lawmakers to weigh the evidence and decide for themselves. Republicans seem unwavering in their opposition to impeaching the president. The Judiciary Committee rejected Republican Jim Jordan's amendment that would have eliminated the first article of impeachment, which accuses is the president of abuse of power. North Korea is criticizing the United States for its criticism of Pyongyang's ballistic missile tests. The U.S. called the action hostile provocation. The North called the United States comments foolish and said the U.S. may have blown its chance to salvage nuclear negotiations. This comes just weeks ahead of a deadline set by leader Kim Jong-un for Washington to offer mutually acceptable terms to revive the nuclear talks. Hundreds of people joined an evening demonstration among Hong Kong skyscrapers Thursday, marking six months since the city's protest movement began. The crowd chanted Hong Kong people revenge in anger at police, use of tear gas and widespread arrests. The government isn't showing any signs of making further concessions. A fire broke out on Russia's only aircraft carrier today. Twelve sailors were hurt while putting out the flames. The carrier has been deployed in recent years to Syria in support of the Russian military campaign there. The vessel has had a troubled record. In 2012, it broke down in the Bay of Biscay and had to be towed thousands of miles to its home port. In 2009, it spilled hundreds of tons of oil off the coast of Ireland and caught fire, an accident in which one sailor died. And last Last year, a crane fell through its deck. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks very much, Mark. Coming up, we talk with the second highest executive in New York State, Lieutenant Governor of New York, Kathy Hochul. She joins us to talk about her new role as chair of the Democratic Lieutenant Governors Association. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. New York Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul wears several hats, including work on long-term economic plans for various regions throughout the state, addressing the lack of skilled workers and acting as liaison with the state's elected representatives down in Washington. Now she has yet another hat to wear, chair of the Democratic Lieutenant Governors Association, and I'm pleased to welcome New York Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul now to Bloomberg for today's Conversation in Chief. Ma Madam Lieutenant Governor, thank you very much for being with us. Delighted to be here, David. Let me ask with a basic question. What does Lieutenant Government do, Governor do? You do this in New York, but now you're also chair yes. of the Democratic uh, Lieutenant Governors across the country. What do Lieutenant Governors do? Every state has a different definition, but what I've done here in New York State is to champion the issues that are important to our administration. And I was out there, I was the face of the increase in the minimum wage, for example, paid family leave. I chair all the economic development councils around the state, so I'm on the ground making sure that we create jobs and help new businesses prosper. Something called workforce development. We're talking about critical job training skills so people from New York City to Plattsburgh, uh, the employers have a well-trained, experienced workforce as well as the opportunity for individuals to have good jobs. So I get a chance to work on so many issues. Climate change, for example. You look at what's happened in Washington, this has created a whole new opportunity for those of us in state government to lead because we've had such an abject failure in Washington. And so when the, we, the president walks away from our obligations under the Paris Agreement to protect and save our planet, mm -hmm. we can step up in New York and team up with others. So it's very, it's not defined, David, but it's very expansive. Well, it is a wide range of important issues. Uh, two issues. How much of that's private? How much is public? What do you do with private-public partnerships? Because I know in some of your economic development things, it's private and public. And how do you measure success? Critically important because I come from a place that did not know what success was. I'm from Buffalo, New York. Mm -hmm. I saw what happened when the Bethlehem Steel plants and the major manufacturing areas, they just left. And they left us high and dry for literally two or three decades. So we measure success by are we keeping young people in communities that have been given up mm -hmm. for lost in the past? We have turned the corner. There are more millennials and young people going to the upstate communities that have been, that have been abandoned before. New York City, a hot magnet for technology. I mean, that's a barometer of success, how many jobs we've created, how much investment we've had, major infrastructure projects here in New York City in particular, airports, bridges, roads, the subway system. So we're measuring because we're now creating a whole new system that is now functioning. And the contrast between what's going on in the state of New York and I served as a member of Congress in Washington, so I know what dysfunction and gridlock looks like. It's night and day. And that's why, as chair of the Democratic Lieutenant Governors Association, I'm talking about what we can do in our capacities as lieutenant governors, not just what's good for our state, but what's good for the nation, and that is to elect more Democrats. So talk about that agenda in your new role as chair. Uh, is that sort of a best practices? Sort of, let's all get together and talk about what we're doing and talk about what we could share? Or how, how do you lead that uh, group? So we are a political operation. We are a sanctioned national democratic committee. I'm a member of the DNC. I work closely with Tom Perez, our national mm -hmm. chairman, who also comes from Buffalo like myself. I've known him a long time. And he has had a 50-state strategy, saying that there's no state, regardless of whether it's purple or red, that we will leave untouched and not field strong candidates. So what I do, I'll be out there helping identifying races where we, our involvement can matter, fundraising, making sure that people have access to good polling and data, and helping them literally win races. And having won races in the state of New York, uh, it's, New York is not all Manhattan and Brooklyn. Right. Upstate New York is very conservative. That's where I want a seat in Congress. So when we go to places like North Carolina to help the lieutenant governor, uh, a new Democratic governor, be there to be a partner to Roy Cooper, that's important. And I can speak to those people. I can talk about how you frame our values as Democrats in a way that will resonate with working men and women who feel they've been abandoned up until now. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to talk about messaging in the areas that we need to win for our lieutenant governors, but it also helps what we're doing out there is paving the way for our Democratic candidate next November. Is it harder because New York is perceived as so blue? It's sort of like it's almost a foregone conclusion. It's hard to stir people up, unlike Michigan or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania, maybe Florida. Well, it depends on what part of New York State you're from. I mean, the population is in an intensely blue area. The geographic area is intensely red. And I've straddled both worlds successfully, again, having represented the blue area in Congress and now representing the entire state. So I know the issues that matter to people. They love the fact, regardless of where you live, that we are now working on making prescription drugs more affordable. And one of the reasons I won my seat in Congress, won over Republican voters in a seat I never had a shot to win, was I talked about 
protecting Medicare and issues that resonated across party lines. That's what we need to do more of. Remind the voters, remind Democrats who've abandoned us, who thought we were not fighting for them, that no one has your back more than the Democratic Party. And I can make sure as chair of the party of this particular political organization, the Democratic Lieutenant Governors, who have a better pulse than anybody of what's going on in these states, because we're out there every single day, of how we can get that done and deliver more victories for Democrats. We're talking with Kathy Hochul. She's the Lieutenant Governor of the state of New York. I say all politics is local, I've heard. Let's talk about local, particularly for Bloomberg viewers, salt. State and local taxes. Uh, it's, been, it's a real thorn in a lot of the sides of people who are watching this right now. Is there any chance of making progress on that in Washington? The governor and I are working on this intensely because, to me, it was a knife through the heart of New Yorkers, done by a New Yorker. I mean, this is Donald Trump, who has his parting gift to this state that he's Former now... Former New Yorker. Yeah, as he's abandoned <laughs> the state because he turned upside down this whole fundamental principle of taxation that has been in place since Abraham Lincoln was president. No double taxation. And as a result, New Yorkers are paying $16 billion more in taxes with this, felt with this signing of a pen on that legislation. It hurt us deeply. We've sued in court. We've tried to find alternatives, uh, charitable organizations that people contribute to. Uh, I wish I could give you an answer that we're solving this. I think it also comes down to having a new occupant in the White House who understands that states like New York, California, New Jersey are important states and the fundamental unfairness of taxing people twice on their hard-earned money is unconscionable. I believe it's unconstitutional. How long is your term? As chair. I have a four-year, well, oh, no, lieutenant, chair. lieutenant of the, governor. Of the Democratic it's it's a one-year term. I'll be in, I just took office this week. I'll be in this position. I'll be going to DNC meetings. I'll be involved in the yeah. convention all the way through 2020. So this is our opportunity yeah. uh, that we never had before because when I was first elected, we only had 14 Democratic lieutenant governors. Now we have 24. We had huge gains, and all the action is now in the state houses. Stay it sure tuned. Is. It sure is. Exactly. We'll stay tuned. I hope you come back and give us an interim report on how you're doing. Love to. Thank yeah. you. Great to have you with us. That's New York Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul. Coming up, President Trump signals progress on a trade deal with China. Is it real or is it yet another tease? We talk with former U.S. Ambassador to China Max Baucus. That's next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. President Trump says we're very, very close to what he calls a, quote, big trade deal with China. And reportedly, the U.S. is now offering to dial back some of those tariffs that it's imposed. Welcome now, Max Baucus. He's former U.S. ambassador to China. He also, by the way, served six terms in the United States Senate, representing his home state of Montana as a Democrat. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being back with us. You, you bet, Dave. Okay. Uh, read the tea leaves, so to speak, for us here. Are we really, really close to an interim deal with China? I think we're close. I think it's very important, though, that um, the December 15 tariffs do not go into effect because that's going to have a very chilling effect on the Chinese leadership. Mm -hmm. It's going to strengthen the hardliners in China. So it's very important that we not increase tariffs uh, on December 15th. Now, if we do not, if there is agreement, then lots of questions come up. Number one, how big of a deal is it? Number two, you know, it's, uh, the details are always in the fine print. One doesn't know how this is going to be interpreted. Yeah, yeah. And add to that, we have to remember as Americans that there's no international tribunal, there's no independent judiciary to decide whether or not each party is living up to its end of the deal. So it's really up to China, it's up to the United States. And one final point here, <laughs> frankly, is as it's reported in the press, it puts a lot of pressure on China because basically it's the U.S. that's calling the shots. If the U.S. will decide whether to, quote, snap back and increase those tariffs, depending upon whether the U.S. thinks China's living up to its end of the deal. Well, that's a key element. There was a report, Bloomberg reported today, that the United States may be proposing not just suspending the, 50, the December 15 tariffs, but actually cutting by 50 percent right. tariffs on like $350 billion exactly. worth of goods, right. but with the understanding that we can put it right back, as you say, snap back at any time, right. if we think you're not, in our judgment, I guess, yes, that's in right. complying with this. Right. Is that an effective way to deal with the Chinese? Because there has been questions in the past whether the Chinese really followed through on their agreements. Well, there, there's clearly been that question. When I served as ambassador to China, um, I, I ran into that a lot. The China will say something, sounds good, they'll write it down on paper, but don't really follow through. Something else to remember here, though, there's a kind of a disconnect, I think, between the people 
in China and the Chinese government, or maybe even the American people and the American government. Chinese people, I go to China often, I talk, I talk almost daily to my Chinese friends. Chinese people like Americans. They like American values. They look up to American values. They just know that in their country, in their system, they've got to live under what they have. It's okay, they're making money, they're doing okay, they're, they're, they're raising their family and so forth. But Chinese people like American people. And I think we should always keep that in mind, not get too wrapped around the axle about the governments going back and forth fighting each other. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. The people are critical. At the same time, we have two leaders who seem to have pretty strong egos, and President Xi and President Trump. Both of them I, I seem to feel that they need to come out of this saying, we, I won. Yeah. Is that possible? Can we do something that say, President Trump can come to the United States and look at, look at what I got for us, and President Xi can say, I didn't give up that much, or I didn't give up our sovereignty, or I didn't give up our power, our status? Well, saving face is important, both to President Trump and to President Xi. But I, there's no doubt in my mind, if you kind of split the baby, then wrap it around a nice big bow of red, you know, ribbon, and it's going to then be uh, able to uh, be presented by each president as okay. And basically, the good part there is that'll help stabilize markets. That'll get rid of some of the unpredictability, and that's very important. Yeah, so there's a headline that's just crossing as we've been talking that President Trump reportedly will be meeting with his advisor to talk about the U.S.-China trade deal at 2.30 this afternoon. So just coming up in a, a little less than two hours from right, right now. Right. So it seems to be moving fairly quickly. We do have this deadline that's coming up on, on Sunday. But let right. me ask a more basic question. Yeah. Let's assume we get this interim agreement. We don't know what's in it, but we have some sense of what's in it. Right. Will we have accomplished very much? Because we have to remember, you know, we had relations with trade relations with China before we started this. It went backwards, I yeah. think it's fair to say. Yeah. Uh, are we going to be well ahead of where we started out, or are we basically going back to neutral? Well, if their ter current tariffs are rolled back 50 percent, that's huge progress. That makes a big difference. Then we can start with that base. But having said all that, really the, the concerns the United States government has with China go beyond trade. Yeah. It's national security, it's geopolitical positioning, there's a lot of other factors. And the main point here is we really, as a country, have to recognize China is China. China's a country. China's not going anywhere. This could be the biggest country in the world not too many years down the road. We have to deal with China with respect and find a way to deal with China so that they deal with us with respect, too. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you've said this before, that the real issue is national security, it's tech, it's intellectual property, it's theft, things like that. Yeah. That's the real guts of it. That's what we have to get to. Is there a way for us to make real progress on that without challenging President Xi's sovereignty? Because this is something he staked out his reputation on. I think there's a way. Nothing's 100 percent. We have to address these issues. But um, sovereignty is so important to any country, especially to China. And China is not going to give up its so-called Made in China 2025, right. its subsidies, its um, focus on new technologies of the future. Because after all, China wants to be a big growing country, just like any country would. I take my hat off to, to yeah. China for trying to accomplish all that. So we, but the, we want to do it fairly, but that's a difficult part because Chinese sense of fairness is different from American mm -hmm. sense of fairness, and we have to understand that. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Thank you so much to former U.S. Ambassador to China and former Montana Senator Max Baucus. I'm happy to say we're going to have more with the ambassador in our second hour coming up on Bloomberg Radio, including a discussion of passing the USMCA, that's the NAFTA successor, in the Senate. And we want you to stay tuned now for special coverage of the U.K. election results. That will be coming at 5 p.m. Eastern time today. That's 10 p.m. London when those polls close. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio.